Join us each week for Iowa Realty's Home Buyer's Guide, an informative hour featuring Iowa Realty open houses, new construction projects, and financial information for today's home buyer. If you would like more information concerning this morning's show or how your home may be included on Home Buyer's Guide, contact the Iowa Realty office nearest you. Home Buyer's Guide is brought to you by Iowa Realty, Iowa's largest. Jeff Johnson on TV8, Iowa's news leader. I thank the people of this state for giving me a unbelievable opportunity to serve. Another Washington lawmaker calls it quits, and another, and another, and more Americans vote against this year's candidates than for them. What's wrong with American politics? We'll ask three members of Congress who decided to leave, Republican Senator Warren Rudman of New Hampshire, Democratic Senator Kent Conrad of North Dakota, and Republican Representative Vin Weber of Minnesota. And we'll ask former Democratic candidate Paul Songus about the protest presidential primary. The season of political discontent, an issue facing the nation. Face the Nation with Chief Washington Correspondent Bob Schieffer. And now from CBS News in Washington, Bob Schieffer. And welcome again to Face the Nation. Well, one thing that most people seem to agree on these days is that the country has major problems. But the government does not seem to be able to do much about them. Why is that? Some say the problem begins with the way we elect our leaders. Former Senator Paul Songus has just been through the presidential primary process, and so we're going to begin our discussion with him. And I want to start, uh, Senator, by saying, first, welcome, and second, with a very simple question. What's wrong with American politics these days? Well, I suppose everybody has their view, but the fact is that there's not enough conviction and, and belief uh, in the system. The fact is, if you look at both parties, what they're doing is they're starting off with polling data, in deriving their policies from the polling data. And that's simply, it, you start off with cynicism, then don't be surprised that cynicism is what you get back. It seems to me that we ought to go back to what we used to do in this country, that people who believed in things took the long view, uh, had a set of convictions and run with that, and simply throw all the consultants and the pollsters into the Potomac and go from there. Is it possible with the process that we now have to, to select the party nominees to actually do that, though? Um, perhaps not a few years ago, but I think there's now a growing outcry uh, on the part of the American people. And I traveled this country, as you know, for a year. Warren Redmond, who's sitting here, would, I think, tell you the same thing. The people are now beginning to figure out this country is in trouble because we have refused to make very hard choices. And there's now a kind of collective angst about where we're going. And I think particularly among young people, there is a sense that our generation is going to ruin uh, what is the promise of their generation. So I see a kind of activism that frankly was not there two or three years ago. So I, I must say, I walk out of this thing very optimistic about it. It may take a while, a couple of years, but I think that constituency to make those hard choices is very much there. Well, that gives us something to think about. We'll take a break here for just a second. We'll be back to continue this conversation with Paul Sanders. Back in a moment. This portion of Face the Nation is sponsored by the Archer Daniels Midland Company. ADM, supermarket to the world. At first, it doesn't seem to be much of a problem. A tire here, a tire there. But it all adds up to the point where Americans dispose of more than 250 million tires a year. But at the Archer Daniels Midland Company, we're doing something about it. We're taking tires that would ordinarily be an environmental problem. We're shredding them and mixing them with coal to create a fuel that burns cleaner in our power plant, providing the energy we need to produce ethanol, a gasoline additive derived from surplus cornstarch that helps reduce carbon monoxide emissions by up to 25%. So as you can see, by using a little ingenuity, we at ADM have got yet another good idea rolling. 
ADM, supermarket to the world. And we're back with the former Democratic presidential candidate, Paul Sangas. Senator Sangas, uh, I want to get back to your talking just a moment ago about uh, you leave this whole process uh, with optimism. But I must say, when, when I look at some of the polling that was done where Democrats are about to, uh, it looks, if all goes as expected now, as if uh, Governor Clinton is going to be the nominee, and yet I see in the CBS News polling only one Democrat in three has a favorable rating of Governor Clinton. Perhaps an even more disturbing thing in a Time magazine poll out this week, it said that 67% of those polls said that they thought that Governor Clinton would do anything to get elected. Equally disturbing, 60% of the people said they thought that President Bush would do the same thing. That, to me, does not seem to be a, a, very, a reason for very much optimism about the kind of candidates that the system is producing. Why is this great cynicism abroad in the land? Well, uh, Bob, let's be realistic here. The fact is that we're electing, I mean, let me leave the Democrats aside because whatever I say would be misinterpreted. Let's take the Republican side. The fact is that four years ago, the American people had a choice. The choice was between George Bush, who would say anything to anybody to get elected, I think you're right in that respect, and Bob Dole. Now, Bob Dole uh, came across as angry and that kind of thing, but Bob Dole had the courage to do what's necessary to bring this country back into some kind of fiscal discipline and give us the direction for the future. So the fact is the American people were given a choice on the Republican side between irresponsibility and responsibility and chose irresponsibility. Now whose fault is that? Do you blame the system or do you blame an environment that says the only way you get elected to anything is to promise everything to everybody? The fact is that strong people who run on realism and, and the kind of courage this country used to be known for, often get defeated by those, and I'm just using the Republican Party here now, uh, by those who would offer anything. George Bush has no core. George Bush, after the Persian Gulf, should have said to the American people, we have real problems. I'm going to use that my popularity to solve those problems and steer this course where it should be, and there are going to be some pretty hard choices in that. He chose not to do that and the country has paid their price. So here you have a Warren Rodman who walks away saying it just does not work, and that is a, an enormous loss uh, to the American people. So at some point, there is a justice here. The fact is, I believe, the reason I'm optimistic, I think things have shifted. This may be the last uh, election where someone can do very well promising things. I think in the future, it's gonna have to be someone who can come across as a candidate who says, this is where we have to go, and in essence, tap into the greatness that this country is all about, not the perceived or the presumed selfishness that many candidates seem to start off with. Well, what you seem to be saying is that, that under the current system, those who are able to evade the issues are rewarded, while those who choose to face up to the issues uh, are not rewarded. Is, is that what you're well, saying? Well, Bob, look, look at my own candidacy. I mean, if, you, if people say, why did he lose, it comes down to money, uh, my lack of a charismatic personality, if you will, those kinds of things. But my message carried me much further than anybody predicted when we began. Why? Because people are receptive to that. The fact is, if you take away the pollsters in the Washington connection with the uh, various uh, committees that are down there, the uh, political committees, the fact is, around the country, the country is ready to make these changes. Washington will be the last person to figure out uh, what is going on. But I think the country is ready. I really do. Do you think at this point that uh, it would be better for the Democrats uh, for Bill Clinton to get the nomination or if someone else, if a movement emerged to, uh, to choose someone else? Uh, while Clinton uh, seems to be winning the primaries, when you look at these polls, he does not seem to be particularly popular with Democrats or with the public at large. In fact, one poll I saw, saw showed that uh, Vice President Quayle had a higher favorable rating uh, than Mr. Clinton. What, what would you advise the party at this point? What I would advise the party is very simple. Um, uh, there are problems um, that we have, and you refer to those, and what you have to do is simply go to the American people and say, here is the message, here is what we would do, so that despite whatever doubts they may have on these other matters, that they would perceive that it's in their own self-interest, in the interest of the country, to have these programs put in place as opposed to those of George Bush. Now that means taking some very hard positions on some very tough issues, and very much what I think my candidacy was about. So. What I said to the Democrats, look, I'm out of this race, take my message, adopt it. If you look at the New York, let me give you a specific here. If you look at the New York primary, 
Um, I was not in that race. I got 30% of the vote. And where did those votes come from? From Long Island, from Westchester County, those kinds of places that are critical if a Democrat wishes to win in November. So you don't have to be a rocket scientist here to figure out how you beat George Bush. And I think if someone adopts a policy that has some um, fiscal discipline and direction to it, I think you're going to see people flock to that banner, and I think that's how you beat George Bush. What are you going to do with your delegates? What do you have, 400 and, at last count, how many delegates do you have at this point? I think we have about 530, something 500. Like what, are you, what are you going to do with them? Are you going to release them anytime soon, or will you wait oh, no. to the convention, or what? No, I want those delegates to be a force for a change in the Democratic Party. The fact is that I think that we did very well because we had a message I have to have that message survive and do well in the Democratic Party. I'm a Democrat. I want the Democrats to win, but, and I think I've shown them how to do that. So I want those delegates to be there in any that we get in the future as a catalyst for movement in the direction this country has to go in. All right, so you, you've run for president. Uh, that part of your life is over, I suppose you would say. What are you going to do next? Well, in about an hour, I'm going to walk with Don Henley to try to save Walden Woods, but I don't think that's your question. Um, Warren and I have talked about maybe doing something together, um, but the fact is that I think I represent a certain philosophy the Democratic Party must embrace, and I intend to speak out. I mean, I'm not going to fade away. That's not my personality profile. You, uh, Warren, I take you to mean Senator Rudman? Yes. All right. Well, Senator Rudman is going to be uh, with us in just a moment. Senator Songus, thank you. Best of luck to you. We're out of time. We will continue this discussion in just a moment when we return, talking about Congress with three members who have decided they're going to leave it. The Crow and the Pitcher. How can you increase investment returns? Merrill Lynch has a mutual fund strategy that may help. Pick one of our funds you think holds promise. Then systematically invest the same amount time after time. More shares are added when the price is down, fewer when the price goes up. The moral is, a consistent approach may raise the level of your reward. Microsoft Word for Windows is so easy it just takes one click to make your work look twice as good. Microsoft Word, the word processor for Windows. Dan figures the time he saves using Microsoft Excel for his budget is time well spent with others. Microsoft Excel, the spreadsheet for Windows. Corn. Not only is it America's most abundant crop, it's also the most versatile. At the Archer Daniels Midland Company, we get golden corn oil from it, as well as corn sweeteners, ethanol, and protein products used in animal feeds. Today, we're extracting even more sophisticated value-added products from corn. Products such as citric acid, which gives candies and fruit-flavored beverages their tangy flavor. And lysine, an amino acid that optimizes the nutrition of poultry and swine feeds. But even this list is far from complete. Right now, we're developing additional value-added products from corn, along with innovative applications for them. Because at ADM, we believe the potential of this crop is nearly as great as its supply. ADM, supermarket to the world. You know why I like CBS this morning? Well, oh, because they say it's breakfast for your head and it sounds neat. No, because it's where Michael J. Fox will be talking about directing us. Tomorrow. And we're back talking this morning about the confused state of American politics. And joining us now, three members of Congress who, who took a look at what, where they were and what they were doing and were not able to accomplish and said enough. Senator Warren Rudman of New Hampshire, who joins us this morning from Concord, Massachusetts, a popular town this morning because that's where Paul Songus was when we talked to him just a moment ago. And here in Washington, Senator Kent Conrad of North Dakota and Representative Ben Weber of Minnesota. Gentlemen, welcome to all of you. Uh, let me just start first, uh, Senator Rudman. Senator Songus uh, just said that uh, the two of you may get together on some sort of project now. What, what is that about? 
Well, Paul and I, of course, share uh, the view that the fiscal integrity of this country, unless things are changed very rapidly, uh, is going to dissipate and we will face a major crisis uh, within a very few years. Uh, we're sitting here in Concord, Massachusetts this morning, probably appropriate. Uh, what we really need in this country uh, is a new Paul Revere, if you will, to sound the alarm. Not that the British are coming, but that the collapse is coming of the United States economy. If Paul Songs and I together have credibility in that issue, and I believe that we do, uh, I'm going to be leaving office. Uh, he is going to be obviously not in public office. We might well do something together uh, to generate support across this country amongst working people of America who care about their children and their grandchildren that we're going to have to get responsible in both political parties and address the issue. And we will talk about that as the year goes on. Well, let, let's talk, all, all of us uh, talk about that just a little bit, because in some ways, I was thinking about this, this broadcast and this discussion this morning, in some ways it seems to me that sort of process is overtaken politics. And when I say politics, I mean, I mean government. I mean running for office, running the government once you get there. I, I sit and I watch the Congress every day and I see so little getting done, kind of going through the motions. I, I watch the Senate. I see quorum call after quorum call when not much gets done. I see campaigns where we have the commercials and, and this and that that don't seem to have to do much to do with anything. What, what, what's going wrong here? Senator, why, why did you decide to leave? Well, as you know, in my case, uh, I'd made a pledge. My pledge to the people of my state was I wouldn't run again if the deficit was not brought under control. So in my case, I'm keeping my word. But there's a larger frustration that I think many people share, and that is a failure to deal with the problems that face the country. This country is in trouble. It's in trouble in a whole series of areas, uh, not the least of which is the budget deficit. And there's an absence of leadership, frankly, uh, that, that we face in this country. And well, everybody knows what the problems are. Why, why is the Congress unable to deal can, with can them? We, can we back up? Sure. I think that there is one central problem that people may not yet be ready to face up to, and I, and I think it's at the core of this. And it may even be a constitutional problem. I'm convinced after 12 years here with Republicans in the White House and Democrats controlling the Congress, we will not solve these problems if we have another four years of divided government. And the, reason I, the only reason I'm pessimistic about that is that's the one area where there doesn't seem to be much indication that the people want to change. The people like having the Democrats in control of the legislative branch and the Republicans in control of the White House or vice versa. And I, you know, I'd be interested in hearing my, what my colleagues say, but I can't imagine us really, really grappling with significant change in any area as long as you have the two parties basically controlling the opposite ends of Pennsylvania Avenue. It doesn't mean that either one is wrong or good or bad. It just means... Uh, the country has not made a decision to turn the government over to one party, and so they, you can't really expect a breakthrough, in my view. Well, Senator Rudman, well, let I, me bring I you agree. into that. Why is that? Why, why do people want uh, one party controlling the Congress and one controlling the White House? Well, I'm not sure if people are that thoughtful about it. I think Republican presidential candidates have been more successful for a variety of reasons. Uh, some of them legitimate, some probably not. But he is absolutely correct. Uh, Divided government uh, has, has cost us a great deal. Uh, I said in the Senate floor to the consternation of some of my, my colleagues that, you know, I would like to see a Republican Congress uh, with a Republican president for the next four years or a Democratic president with a Democratic Congress. Let there be accountability. The problem today, Bob, is that the American people don't know who is accountable. The president blames the Congress. The Congress blames the president. Both are right to some degree, but the American people are totally confused. And as Paul Songa said, the reason for the cynicism is they're frankly tired of it all. It's time for the American people to say, let's elect a government, hold them accountable. If they don't do the job, then toss them out. It, it also, if I, can, if I can add to that, I think that the years of this divided government situation have caused both parties to avoid taking tough stands on controversial issues. Everybody's sort of in a defensive posture. Republicans don't want to risk the White House. Democrats don't want to risk the Congress. And taking a strong stand on economic growth or welfare reform or educational reform, something like that, well, that might actually risk a few votes. So both, both parties have gotten into this totally defensive posture. But again, I come back to the point, I am just convinced it's a result of divided government, and, and unless the country will face up to that very difficult issue, because for all of American history, people in this country have had a, a, a cynicism about political parties. George Washington warned us against them. This is deep-rooted in the American psyche, but it absolutely has to be confronted. Well, well maybe I could just too. say that <clears throat> another reason I think also. divided government is a problem, but there's also a certain amount of confusion. Congress is not the executive. There's really only one person in our country who can stand up 
tell the American people the truth about our condition and convince the American people that we need change. And there's risk in that. And until we have somebody who is willing to take on that role, we're not going to convince the American people that changes have to be made. Senator? Senator Rudman, you were trying to say something. <clears throat> Well, I was just going to say that the other reason, of course, is, let's face it, the, the Congress is, is afraid of its own constituency. The American people really have been led to believe, irresponsibly, you can have all of these programs that continue to grow and somebody else will pay for them, and God forbid you say, look, we're going to have to curtail the programs and raise your taxes. Uh, people are afraid to say that. Look what happened in the Senate. You reported it uh, on Friday where we attempted a very modest look ahead to cap entitlement programs, and the first thing that was thrown at us was you're trying to hurt disabled veterans. Mm -hmm. Well, nobody was trying to hurt disabled veterans. We are trying to get some annual review of entitlement programs, which everyone in both parties knows has to be done. People have become afraid of their constituencies, and getting reelected is the most important thing. And quite frankly, I think people ought to be willing to take some political risks. You might lose an election, but that might not be the worst thing in the world for the country. I mean, well, could I just ask sure. Warren if really don't we have a situation in which everybody's political ox has to get gored? That is, uh, the Democrats don't want to cut entitlements, don't want to cut domestic spending. Republicans don't want to give revenue and don't want to cut defense. Our situation is so serious that everybody's political ox has to be gored. Everybody's got to get out of their political trench if we're going to solve these problems. Uh, this problem could be solved uh, during the next uh, year, uh, assuming uh, George Bush is re-elected or a Democratic president, if both political parties put the interests of the economy of this country and the future of our children ahead of everything else and said, we are not going to take political shots at each other, we will come up with different solutions, but the aim is to stabilize the entitlement growth in this country. But until the two political parties are willing to do that, we continue to have one taking advantage of the other, which is what's been happening for the last 12 years. I think either party could solve the, the problem. I really believe that. They would do it differently. We shouldn't minimize the differences. The reasons that there are Republicans and Democrats in this country is because we disagree on some things philosophically. From my standpoint, what, what we've been discussing here for the last minute or two is a bipartisan approach, and that's always wonderful. I think most bipartisanship I've seen in Congress ends up being lowest common denominator bipartisanship. If that's the only way we can deal with some of the country's problems, okay, I would rather give the, the authority to one party to do what they really think is right as opposed to some you know, negotiated deal that no, neither one is very happy with and then hold that party accountable that's why i'm talking about about divided government as, as the source of this of this difficulty I, I think it is very interesting to hear two republicans say if it took having a democratic president to do it the problems in this country are so enormous well, that, that, that maybe that's what we, we ought to do. We do have another preference, understand. I, I understand yeah. exactly what you're saying, but I, I would tell you, Senator Conrad, you would almost say, say the opposite, that, that the problems are so enormous if it took a Republican president along with a Republican Congress, that, that maybe, we ought to, maybe we ought to try that. You know, I'm not certain if it's a matter of a Republican or Democrat. I think what is required is that we have, first of all, presidential leadership, somebody to stand up, tell the American people the truth, and galvanize them to action. They're not going to be willing to sacrifice anything unless they're convinced it has to be done. Let me just ask you, what, what happened to bipartisanship? I, I, I've been in Washington now about 23 years. I have never seen a more divisive atmosphere than we have now. I mean, we've, uh, sure, as you say, we, there are, there, there's a reason for Republicans and Democrats yeah. because there are two different approaches to everything. But why is it that you cannot seem to get together? Why is it now that people go to the Senate floor and offer amendments, and clearly the only reason they're offering it is somebody, so somebody will have to vote against it, and you can make a 30-second television ad against it. The Democrats do the same thing. What happened to... to you, just, you just answered your own question, Bob. I mean, that's exactly what Paul Songus referred to in the first segment of this program. Frankly, if you could constitutionally abolish for the next three years all political consultants pollsters of media experts and the like and get done with this 30 second uh, negative campaigning that everybody's involved with then i think you could have more bipartisanship but the problem is that everybody is afraid to do the tough thing because they're going to hear about it in the next election what has happened in america is that the method of electing candidates has changed radically even in the last 10 or 12 years it is becoming vicious it is becoming mean and people are getting sick of it both in office and out of office, and I expect we'll see some change. Also, I think in fairness, we ought to say that the media plays a role here, too. Uh, the media has been chasing what are really diversions, this little scandal, this little scandal. Instead of talking about the, the checks in the House Bank, we ought to be talking about the 400 billion of hot checks we're going to write this year. 
or the presidential plan over the next five years to add $1.8 trillion to the national debt. Those are things we ought to be discussing. Yeah, it, it, my, my fear about this election is related to, to just what, what Kent said. We're going to have anywhere from 100 to 180 new members in the United States House of Representatives. That could be a positive thing, new blood, fresh faces. 180? Like that. That's the upward estimate that some people have made. Certainly 100. Almost everybody thinks there'll be 100. My, point, my concern about that is exactly what Kent just said. I, I've talked to a lot of those candidates and read what they're saying to their, uh, to their constituents or their future constituents. They're not pledging to do anything that, that addresses any of our nation's problems. We're going to have 150 new members here that are promising not to use a bank that's already been closed for a year and give their parking spot over to a homeless person and not work out in the house gym. Or I mean, what, how does that help us resolve the health care problem? How does it help us get a handle on the deficit? How does it restore the economy? Elections matter. If we don't get down to talking about major issues in this election, believe me, the, the next Congress is not going to be any more successful in dealing with those problems than this Congress has been. Well, gentlemen, I'd like to say to all of you, while this is a somewhat depressing discussion, I, I found it very enlightening this morning. My thanks to all of you for uh, being with us this Thank morning. You, we'll back in a, be back in a moment. Thank you, Bob, for the final word. The Country Mouse and the City Mouse. There are all protected. Our advantages in venturing farther afield. And to help you manage the risk and explore the world's possibilities, Merrill Lynch offers a wide choice of global mutual funds. The moral is, to expand your rewards, expand your horizons. Now, IBM is going beyond conventional computing by pioneering a way to touch millions of lives. Brains blow! You cataract! They love the hands-on stuff. Information becomes something with an imagination. IBM Multimedia. You can touch so many emotions with pictures and colors and sounds. It's really wonderfully exciting. Well, most of our mail this week reflected the discontent that we've been talking about during today's broadcast. And since we've been talking about the anger that's currently being directed at the candidates, at the Congress, and the White House, we should also tell you we get plenty of mail that is critical of the media. Some viewers complain that reporters, including this one, just aren't being tough enough on the candidates this year. But a lot of the letters reflect the opinion expressed by Violet Reed of Floral, Arkansas, who wrote... The only difference in a snapping turtle and the media, the turtle turns loose at sundown. Well, while the sun is still high, we'd just like to take a moment to say, see you next week, and thanks for joining us on Face the Nation. This portion of Face the Nation was sponsored by the Archer Daniels Midland Company, ADM, supermarket to the world. If you'd like to write to Face the Nation, send your letters to Bob Schieffer, Face the Nation, 2020 M Street Northwest, Washington, D.C., 20036. This broadcast was produced by CBS News, which is solely responsible for the selection of today's guests and topics. It originated in Washington, D.C. to play them over and over again. They're basically about violence. Know what they're talking about? Chances are it's already in your living room. The story on the CBS Evening News tomorrow. This is CBS. Let's say this is one of those typically beautiful tourism commercials. And seeing it, you wanted to do this. You probably couldn't find this place. After all, you're not from here. But when you come to Minnesota this summer, We'll help you find exactly the vacation you want. So if you want to be here, do some of this, or maybe see this, you should come here. Need some ideas for your vacation? 
Get the Minnesota Explorer. It's free. And it's full of things to see and do all over the state. It'll also help you contact our travel counselors and other people who will help you find the getaway you want. Whatever it is, call 1-800-235-9000 for the free Minnesota Explorer. A true TV special. You can too. Iowa kids fight drugs and alcohol. The right viewing choice for the entire family. Wednesday night, April 15th at 7 on this station. The Inside Story, coming soon to TV8. Next on Health Matters, are you eating your way to a heart attack? Well, it's hard to believe that something that small could be so dangerous to your health. Uh, an egg actually has more cholesterol per weight than any other food that you eat. Learn what you can do to decrease your heart attack risk. Also, find out how to save yourself from the ravages of skin cancer. And you may be getting sick just from the building you work in or the home you live in. These stories and much more next on Health Matters. Health Matters is brought to you by Iowa Methodist Medical Center of Des Moines. Hello, I'm Anita Walker. Welcome to Health Matters.